Welcome to the MICU series and this is going to be on pressors in the ICU. So before I give you the armor that you're going to need to use in the ICU when it comes to pressors, you need to first off understand why and when are you going to be using these pressors in the ICU. Well, when would you use pressors in the ICU? Well, obviously when your patient is in shock. When the patient is in shock is when you're going to be using pressors in order to reverse the shock. So what is shock? A lot of residents answer the question by saying, well, the patient is hypotensive. The patient has a drop in blood pressure. It does not meet criteria to say that somebody is in shock. So let's just first off define shock in the form of numbers. First off, you're going to say systolic blood pressure less than 90 is shock. MAP less than 65 is shock. Now MAP is mean arterial blood pressure which is one third of systolic blood pressure plus two third of diastolic blood pressure. That is known as your mean arterial pressure. So if you're going to say a systolic blood pressure less than 90 and a MAP less than 65, that is perfect. You got it. All right. So these two points I want to remember when you're rounding in your ICU and your attending asks you what is shock, you're going to say systolic blood pressure less than 90 and a MAP less than 65. Awesome. Well, that is good enough if you were an intern or a simple PGY2 resident. But if you're a senior resident in the ICU, you need to have a little bit more of a complex understanding. So this is how you want to be seeing shock. A little bit more we're going to go into now. If you have a patient who's hypertensive at baseline, say his baseline blood pressure runs at about 160 systolic. If there's a drop in systolic blood pressure by 40 points or more, for instance, if there's a drop from 160 to 120 while the patient is not on any antihypertensive, if there is a drop in 40 points of your systolic blood pressure, that is also got to meet criteria for defining shock. All right, so that's the third one you're going to know as a third year resident. Now, what else do we need to know? Imagine there is hypotension but does not really meet definition for all the other kinds of shock. No MAP less than 60. Systolic blood pressure is greater than 90 and not much of a drop of 40 points. If there is ever evidence of end organ damage, say for instance your blood pressure is low but it does not meet criteria but you're seeing evidence of end organ damage such as what? Worsening kidney function or there's elevated troponin because of poor myocardial perfusion or is there production of lactic acid indicating that the patient is actually hypoperfusing. That automatically means your patient is in shock. So it's more of a complex understanding as opposed to just putting orbital numbers. Arbitrary numbers are important, but you need to understand shock in a much deeper level. So remember, evidence of end organ damage is indicative of shock. Awesome. Now, last but not least, my favorite definition of shock is going to be cellular level hypoxia. Every cell in your body, if it is not getting oxygen, to me, that is shock. Cellular level hypoxia. I'm going to go into this specific definition a lot when I'm going to do the lecture on septic shock. So for now, I want you to keep saying cellular level hypoxia and see what you can come up with until we speak more about it in the septic shock lecture. But remember, hypoperfusion to any cell in your body is the ultimate definition of shock. All right, so now since we've understood what really shock is, so because first off, our first step is always define shock. We just define, all right, our patient is in shock, right? Good, great. Now, once you know that the patient is in shock, obviously your next step begins to start to wonder what type of shock this is, right? You have to split apart at this point and tell me what is the type of shock because management of every different type of shock is actually different, right? So you need to understand what are the big different types of shock is. There are actually four different types of shock. Number one is hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is a person who's got volume depletion, maybe he's vomiting a lot, maybe he's got a lot of diarrhea, maybe he's bleeding from somewhere. It could be hemorrhagic versus non-hemorrhagic volume depletion so if you become hypovolemic obviously gonna end up with shock so hypovolemic shock is number one number two is going to be a patient with cardiogenic shock so what is cardiogenic shock think about it this way if your heart is your pump right if your pump fails for whatever reason then it's gonna be called a cardiogenic shock maybe the patient's got a massive MI and therefore the patient cannot pump the blood out maybe the patient's got a severe aortic stenosis that is not pumping
pumping the blood out. Maybe there's an acute valvular regurgitation. Maybe there's some significant arrhythmia that the heart is not being able to fill up the blood to pump it out into your systemic circulation. Whatever it is, if the problem is within the heart and the patient develops shock, then you're going to call it a cardiogenic shock. Number three is going to be obstructive shock. The classic, classic obstructive shock that we all know of is a massive pulmonary embolism. Imagine a big clot sitting in your pulmonary artery, preventing the flow of blood through the right ventricle into the pulmonary circulation. You're completely shutting off the entire circuit, aren't you? If you're not going to pump blood through the pulmonary arteries into the lungs, you're not going to get venous return to the left side of the heart either. If you're not going to get venous return to the left side of the heart, clearly you're going to end up with shock. So obstructive shock, classic one is obviously pulmonary embolism but there are other kinds as well such as a tension pneumothorax or the patient has got a cardiac tamponade all of these are actually going to cause a obstructive type of shock number four last but not least and in fact my favorite is going to be your distributive shock distributive shock classically seen in patients with septic shock guys septic shock when you have sepsis and a full-blown inflammatory cascade is activated all of these things are going to go and stretch your blood vessels out and therefore what's going to happen is there's going to be leakage between these endothelial cells and you're going to have a lot of third spacing of fluid essentially you're going to have a distributive shock because all the fluid within the blood vessel is now distributed outside but it's a significant potent vasodilatory shock all right so remember septic shock is the prime type of distributive shock but septic shock is not the only one that actually gives you a distributive shock you also do have anaphylactic shock remember you eat some peanuts and next thing you know the patient goes into full-blown anaphylaxis anaphylactic shock is going to be causing a significant amount of vasodilation as well apart from that you also need to know few other causes such as acute pancreatitis burns patients all of these things can also give you a distributive type of shock all right now let's go into understanding which type of shock actually will benefit from pressure because not all of them actually benefit from pressors most of them you actually have to correct the primary problem there's only one type that actually genuinely requires pressor support so let's talk about each type of shock again and try to determine which one is actually going to deserve and require pressor support so let's look at this diagram on this board over here if you look at it I have the heart here I have the lungs over here this is the left ventricle that pumps out the blood through the aortic arch and this is the right ventricle that's pumping blood through the pulmonary arteries into the lungs this is the venous return from the lungs to the left side which is through the pulmonary veins and then you have the venous return of the heart through superior vena cava and inferior vena cava so now let's talk about each individual type of shock that we spoke about if you had a hypovolemic shock for whatever reason patient is dehydrated right as I already mentioned if you had a hypovolemic shock what's going to happen here are you going to say that if the patient is hypovolemic he's going to have decreased venous return via the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava yes he is isn't he so which means you're saying the preload coming to the heart is actually going to be low so if the venous return to the heart is actually low then obviously Obviously, less blood is going to get pulped through the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary vein is going to have much less uh, venous return as well and eventually you're going to get a decreased cardiac output so remember now it all comes down to this guys what determines what the blood pressure is going to be in your body it is your beta receptor reflex right your beta receptor reflex remember there's two places where you actually have your beta receptors number one you have it on your carotid sinus and number two you have it on your aortic arch now the carotid sinus communicates communicates with the brainstem the carotid sinus communicates with the brainstem via the ninth cranial nerve whereas your aortic arch communicates with the brainstem via the tenth cranial nerve remember the ninth cranial nerve in the carotid sinus is actually a much more potent beta receptor compared to the aortic arch but nevertheless both of them are going to be your carotid both of them are going to be your beta receptors now how the beta receptors works is very simple if you stretch if you stretch your beta receptors what's going to happen is you will fire both of these cranial nerves and when you fire these cranial nerves your brain stem is going to see it as good god the patient's blood pressure is high let's decrease it so how are you going to decrease blood pressure you're going to decrease blood pressure by activating your parasympathetic system and the parasympathetic system automatically will inhibit your sympathetic and therefore you will get a drop in blood pressure so if you have a patient who's hypovolemic what's going to happen to your beta 
baroreceptor reflex. If you have less volume of blood in your body, you're going to have decreased stretch in the carotid sinus, a decreased stretch in the aortic uh, arch, and as a result, your brainstem is going to see it as a decreased blood pressure. So what is your brainstem going to do? It is going to activate your sympathetic system. It's going to activate your sympathetic system. And what is sympathetic stimulation going to do to your body? Well, two things you need to know. Remember, sympathetic stimulation is going to activate your beta 1 receptors in the heart, which is going to cause increased heart rate, increased inotropy, both of which is eventually going to increase stroke volume and cardiac output. What about in the blood vessel? As you see, I have labeled alpha 1, beta 2 and M3. There are three receptors primarily in the blood vessel. Alpha 1, beta 2 and M3. Guess which one is the only one that's actually innovated? It is alpha 1 guys. Alpha 1 is the only one that actually is innovated. So if you get a sympathetic stimulation, right, your sympathetic stimulation is going to stimulate your alpha 1 receptors and what does alpha 1 do it causes vasoconstriction so if you look at a patient with hypovolemic shock what do you think is going to happen to the patient's total peripheral resistance is he actually going to have vasoconstriction yes he is if he's already vasoconstricting does he require pressors i don't think so so that's the first type of shock that technically would not require pressor support that tells us that a patient with hypovolemic shock rather needs fluids than pressor support all right so this is the first type of shock that technically doesn't deserve a pressor support the next type of shock that we're going to talk about is cardiogenic shock i told you for whatever reason if your heart in inherently maybe massive MI or if the patient's got some valvular regurg or an aortic stenosis whatever the reason may be if your heart is not pumping blood out into the aorta then you're going to call it a cardiogenic shock well if you pump less blood out of the aorta well obviously there's going to be less blood to the aortic arch and less blood to the carotid sinus both of which is going to tell your brainstem oh uh oh there's decreased stretch there is decreased stretch the patient does not have enough blood in the body so what is it going to do? It is going to activate your sympathetic system and as a result cause alpha 1 constriction and therefore going to cause your increased peripheral resistance. So again, in a patient with cardiogenic shock, you are actually going to have a vasoconstriction. So do you require pressure support here? Not really. You need to correct the problem with the heart. Awesome. Let's go to number three. Number three, I told you the patient probably has some form of obstructive shock. So obstructive shock, if you do have a large clot sitting here, right? If you have a large clot sitting here, or the patient's got a pericardial tamponade, or there's a massive pneumothorax that's going on within the chest, all of which is basically going to compress your pulmonary circulation right here and prevent the flow of blood from here right ventricle into the pulmonary circulation is cut off if you cut the circulation what's going to happen just follow the path there's decreased blood return to the lungs from the lungs to the left atrium and the left ventricle eventually there's going to be a decreased cardiac output so if you have a decreased cardiac output into the iota it is the same thing less blood flow through your iotic arch less blood flow through your carotid sinus your brainstem is going to see it as a decreased stretch activating your sympathetic stimulation and causing vasoconstriction so again a patient with an obstructive type of shock inherently will have vasoconstriction so does not require pressure awesome let's go to number four my favorite number four is the patient with a distributive shock as i told you the primary problem with the distributive shock because of sepsis or anaphylaxis or some form of profound inflammatory condition that's causing significant vasodilation so what happens is you undergo vasodilation your blood vessel your arterial system what's going to happen is these vessels are going to get stretched out it's going to get so stretched out that they actually start developing spaces in between them and they start to get leaky they start to get leaky so what happens is all the fluid seeps out from within the blood vessel into the third space but primary problem in a patient with distributive shock is in fact significant vasodilation the vessel is so vasodilated right now so what do you do to a vasodilated vessel guys don't you want to go there and squeeze it and say get back together get in shape so we can raise this blood pressure yes that's what you're going to do so distributive shock 
shock is when you are actually going to use a presser. It is that straightforward. So why pressers? Because pressers are needed for distributive shock, not the other ones. Distributive shock, not like you're not going to use in the other ones. Yes, you may have to use it in the other ones, but the other ones you need to correct the primary problem. Hypovolemic, give fluid, give blood. Obstructive shock, decompress the tension pneumothorax, relieve the patient's massive pulmonary embolism by sucking that clot out or lysing the damn thing. Or if the patient got a massive cardiac tamponade, put a needle in there, do pericardiosynthesis, relieve the problem is what I'm trying to get to. Number three, as I said, if the patient's got a massive MI, go in there, do a cardiac cath and put a stent in there. If it's a valvular problem, fix the valvular problem. If it's an arrhythmia, take care of the arrhythmia. None of them actually require pressors because pressors does not fix the problem there. Whereas here in septic shock, it also doesn't fix the problem but definitely requires pressor support. Alright, so this is the table just outlining more of the causes of the four main types of chalk for you guys to memorize or learn from as you need. We understood what are the types of shock and we know which type of shock actually deserves presses. It's time to talk about the good stuff. Let's talk about pressers, which pressers you're going to play with in the ICU. All right, presser number one. This is by far the best presser that has ever existed. It is always going to be your first line and this presser is going to be called norepinephrine, also known as levofed. So norepinephrine is the best drug. Why is it the best drug? Well, clearly there's been many studies which actually shown that levofed actually works very well in these patients. So now, what is the mechanism of action of the presser norepinephrine? Well, it works on two receptors. It works on your alpha-1 receptor as well as your beta-1 receptor. So clearly, a patient with distributive shock clearly needs alpha-1 stimulation, right? Because alpha-1 in the blood vessel, when you stimulate it, you're actually going to cause vasoconstriction. And vasoconstriction is what you need to raise the blood pressure in a patient with distributive shock. So awesome, alpha-1 stimulation is going to be happening with levofed or norepinephrine. Now with norepinephrine you're also going to get a beta 1 stimulation which is good because beta 1 stimulation is going to give you some amount of increased heart rate. It is going to give you increased inotropy which is increased contraction. So when you get an increased contraction and increased heart rate that's also going to increase your stroke volume and cardiac output which is going to raise your systolic blood pressure. So awesome norepinephrine is always going to be your favorite drug guys. You you will always use norepinephrine first. Your patient is in shock. Doc, what am I going to do? Start the norepinephrine. Doc, the patient's hypotensive. Patient's blood pressure is dropping. What do I do? Start the norepinephrine. From now on, until eternity, until something changes. For now, you guys as third year residents need to know, if a patient is in shock, your first line is always and always going to be norepinephrine. So when can I not use norepinephrine? Because obviously there has to be some time when I cannot use norepinephrine. Well, there is some time. What is the time? When It is when your patient is significantly tachycardic or having a tachyarrhythmia along with the shock. Say the patient's heart rate is about 130, 140, 150. Maybe the patient's going into atrial fibrillation with RVR, rapid ventricular response. These patients, obviously, you do not want a beta-1 stimulation, right? So you do not want a beta-1 stimulation. So for these patients, you'll actually pick a another drug which actually will have effect only on alpha 1 receptors. I'll be going into that in just a second. So if a patient is having significant tachyarrhythmia along with your shock, you would not use norepinephrine. But otherwise, always and always your first choice will be norepinephrine. All right, number two, we have vasopressin. Vasopressin is basically ADH. It's an antidiuretic hormone, right? Vasopressin. Vasopressin is a very good drug. Now, vasopressin has been used primarily as second line in patients with septic shock as an add-on to norepinephrine. That is when you are going to add vasopressin. You always add vasopressin to norepinephrine. Now, norepinephrine is a titratable dose, guys. You go from a low dose to high dose. You can keep up titrating it. It's a titratable dose. Pretty much most pressors you learn in the this section or all the pressors that we have are actually titratable except vasopressin. Vasopressin is actually a very good drug for two reasons. Number one, vasopressin by itself actually causes vasoconstriction and raises your blood pressure. But number two, vasopressin actually will decrease the requirement
requirement of norepinephrine. So if you decrease the requirement of norepinephrine, then obviously the patient is going to have decreased complications from the norepinephrine such as tachyarrhythmias, right? So vasopressin is primarily as an add-on drug to norepinephrine in patients with septic shock. But also you will use vasopressin in patients with variceal bleeding. Alright, so you need to know that variceal bleeding patients, you're also going to use vasopressin. Now, what is the dose of vasopressin? This is very important. You are going to use a fixed dose 0.03 okay a fixed dose 0.03 some places they will tell you you could go up to 0.04 but it's always fixed so for to be on the safe side it's always good for you to just use a fixed dose 0.03 reason is when you go to higher levels say 0.05 0.06 or even anything higher what it's shown it actually causes mesenteric ischemia decreased blood flow to your intestines which is not good all right so mesenteric ischemia is a major problem with vasopressin at much higher doses but apart from that it also causes certain amount of cardiac malperfusion as well so because of these two reasons because of increased intestinal perfusion and decreased cardiac perfusion we stop vasopressin as a fixed dose 0.03 units that's it why is mesenteric ischemia bad think about it this way imagine a patient who's actually not in septic shock and you started the patient on any presser that actually causes decreased mesenteric perfusion the problem with decreased mesenteric perfusion is you're going to cause translocation of your gut flora into your bloodstream. A lot of patients actually with cardiac arrest, you'll often see the patient becomes hypotensive because they have a shock state in your body and your body's vessels are all dilated, right? And then you use pressure support and you're trying to squeeze these vessels and you actually cause mesenteric ischemia. Now a patient who's in shock because of a not septic reason could become septic if you have decreased intestinal perfusion because this is going to cause the gut flora to translocate from the intestines into the blood causing septic shock because of bacteremia so mesenteric ischemia is bad 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 all right so remember vasopressin you want to use fixed dose of 0.03 units that's it all right pressin number three is epinephrine epinephrine is a very good drug so epinephrine what we are going to use when you use it in the IV formulation right you need to know one thing epinephrine the IV formulation the drip that we are going to use as a presser is actually in a concentration of 1 is to 10,000 1 is to 10,000 whereas if you're giving it to a patient as an IM injection in the case of anaphylaxis or you're using it in cardiac arrest when you give epinephrine every three to five minutes right that is in a concentration of 1 is to 1,000 but when you're using an IV drip it has to be more dilute so you will use 1 is to 10,000 units epinephrine unlike the first two presses we spoke about has a little unusual effect what it actually does it actually has a dose dependent response epinephrine and dopamine these are the two that actually have a dose dependent response which means at different doses they will actually stimulate different receptors so what you need to know about epinephrine is that at lower doses it actually stimulates beta 1 receptors so if you start a patient on epinephrine and you add a low dose all you're seeing is tachycardia because why because low dose is supposed to stimulate just the beta 1 receptors so that's what you need to know if you look at epinephrine it actually has a dose dependent response low dose causes beta 1 stimulation so you'll get an increased heart rate increased inotropy but you might not see that significant increase in blood pressure because you're not getting the alpha 1 squeeze yet so what does high dose epinephrine do it actually causes alpha 1 stimulation so high dose epi causes alpha 1 squeeze alpha 1 squeeze is what you require to increase your blood pressure right so remember if you want the patient to actually get a higher blood pressure you want high dose epinephrine or if you're looking for an increased heart rate or an inotropic effect then you're gonna pick a low dose but important point I'm trying to make is with epinephrine you need to know that the patients are gonna have a dose dependent response you're gonna look so cool if you want to increase inotropy you're like you know what let me keep the epinephrine at a low dose or if you want an alpha 1 stimulation increase increase blood pressure you'll be like nurse can you please go on a high dose epi let's increase the dose reason is you know what doses does what to the patient low dose epi beta 1 stimulation high dose epi alpha 1 stimulation number four dopamine dopamine is not one of my favorite drugs reason being is it's a very unpredictable effect that dopamine is going to actually have so dopamine 
obviously just like epinephrine actually has a dose dependent response which means a low dose dopamine less than 2 micrograms all it's going to do is stimulate dopaminergic receptors in the renal vasculature and increase the flow of blood to your kidneys it is going to increase your GFR it is going to increase your urine output from about 2 mics to 10 micrograms it is actually going to cause beta 1 stimulation so it becomes like epinephrine at this point right it's still a low dose from 2 to 10 dopamine is actually going to cause a beta 1 stimulation so you're going to get your increased heart rate increased inotropic effect and increased systolic blood pressure if you go higher than 10 micrograms at this point is when you're actually going to get an alpha 1 stimulation so first step you need to know that this is the mechanism of action of dopamine low dose is only going to cause increased urination that's it nothing else whereas 2 to 10 is going to cause beta 1 stimulation greater than 10 is going to give you an alpha 1 stimulation the reason i do not like dopamine so much is because previously it was believed that dopamine was renoprotective let's give dopamine to increase the perfusion of the kidneys let's increase the gfr let's increase the blood flow to the kidneys now let me ask you something if a patient is in septic shock is monitoring urine output a very important marker to see the response of the patient of course it is it tells you how well you've supplemented the patient with fluids how well is the rest of the body getting perfused it is a becomes a very important marker of telling me what is the volume state of the patient and where the patient is headed so urine output greater than 0.5 cc's of urine per kilogram of body weight per hour is a very important marker to monitor response of patients now you start the patient on dopamine what it's going to do is even if my patient is completely volume depleted it is going to increase perfusion to the kidneys which is falsely going to increase my urine output and falsely give me a misperception that my patient is doing well well in reality it is actually pushing out and making more urine when it's not supposed to make more urine because it's supposed to preserve the fluid within the body all right so let's not use dopamine to increase renal blood flow because it is something we do not need next the other reason i do not like dopamine is dopamine is actually shown to have significant amount of tachyarrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation when used in patients so if i had to compare norepinephrine and dopamine why would i use dopamine dopamine has got such an unpredictable profile whereas norepinephrine is beautiful so i'll always pick norepinephrine well the problem really happens when you would think of using dopamine versus the other presses dopamine was kind of thought to be a safer drug to give via a peripheral line remember pretty much all pressers need to be given via central access right because what's going to happen when you give it in a very small blood vessel is because of this profound amount of vasoconstriction you will end up getting digital ischemia and you can actually lose a limb because of this so it's pretty bad so pressers as a gold standard ideally you're supposed to use it in patients that actually do have a central access but dopamine was kind of thought to be a drug which was more safer to give in peripheral line so when you're in the hospital and your patient suddenly becomes hypotensive and does not have a central access obviously the team will decide at this point hey you know what let's start dopamine peripherally it's fine it's better well there's multiple studies out there that actually proven if you actually use a larger gauge peripheral IV access you can still go ahead and use the other pressors as well there's no reason for you to pick dopamine over any of the other pressers that's important for you to know and one more thing when the nurses come and ask you doc what shall i start the dopamine at and if you say hey start at a low dose well why would you want to increase urination of a patient when he's in shock so remember when somebody is in active shock that's going on if you are starting dopamine go higher than 10 micrograms to increase the blood pressure by giving them the alpha 1 squeeze next let's talk about phenylephrine phenylephrine is a very good drug phenylephrine is a potent vasoconstrictor so phenylephrine basically is going to work on just your alpha 1 receptors and not anything else so remember if you cause an alpha 1 squeeze you're actually going to get an increased blood pressure so when would I use phenylephrine as my first line as I said if I had my septic shock patient a distributive shock patient who's actually having significant tachyarrhythmias then I don't want a beta 1 response I do not want any beta 1 stimulation at this point I will pick phenylephrine because it's actually going to 
cause alpha 1 stimulation now if you also think about it remember your beta receptor reflex plays a big role when you're understanding shock and pressure treatment if you give a patient alpha 1 stimulation what is it going to do to your beta receptor reflex guys is it going to see that oh my god the patients have increased stretch of your carotid sinus and your aortic arch yes it will right therefore what's going to happen is your body's compensatory mechanism is to activate parasympathetic stimulation which is in response it is going to activate your m2 receptors of your heart and as a result cause bradycardia so if you actually use phenylephrine you will expect to see a reflex bradycardia which could be beneficial in your septic shock patient who's actually having tachyarrhythmia Finally, before we move on to two weird drugs, let's talk about the new drug that has just been released. It is known as angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a wonderful drug. Angiotensin 2 causes a profound vasoconstriction, much better than pretty much most other vasopressors, in fact. But it is a new drug and it's often going to be used as a second line to norepinephrine. So once you have a patient on norepinephrine, you can actually use angiotensin 2. Which receptors does it work on? Well, it works on your angiotensin 2 receptors in your blood vessels and causes vasoconstriction so it is a new drug so i don't know if many hospitals are actually going to be using it yet but it is a new drug that's in the market and it's a very very good drug finally let's move on to our weird drugs the two weird drugs which are actually pretty good is dobutamine and mildenone so let's talk about dobutamine first now dobutamine is primarily known as an inotrope well really is it an inotrope? Yes, it is. Well, dobutamine is an inotrope, but it has an important side effect that you know of. So dobutamine, think about the receptors it works on. It works on your beta-1 receptors and beta-2 receptors. If you stimulate beta-1, yes, you're going to get a beautiful inotropic effect. Is exactly what you want. But what happens if you stimulate beta-2 receptors, guys? If you stimulate your beta-2 receptors in your blood vessel, you are going to cause hypotension. So imagine a patient with shock. Now, normally people love to use dobutamine in patients with cardiogenic shock because they're like, oh my God, the heart is not pumping. We need to pump this heart. Let's give the heart a little help here. Let's go give a drug to squeeze the patient's heart so we can increase the blood pressure. Oh my God, let's start dobutamine. Great. The patient's blood pressure is already 70 over 40. Yes, it is because of a cardiogenic cause patient's blood pressure although is 70 over 40 so if you use dobutamine on this patient as the first drug to go to what's going to happen yes you're going to get inotropy but you're going to drop the blood pressure and the patient's going to arrest right in front of your eyes so dobutamine is a good drug but you do not start it on somebody who's hypotensive. So what would you do in this case? Obviously, go to the first drug that you always gonna use, norepinephrine. Start norepinephrine first. Start norepinephrine first, get your alpha one squeeze, and that's gonna bring your blood pressure up. And then you can add on dobutamine to the norepinephrine and now you're going to get the beautiful inotropic effect that you actually need this is why understanding what you're doing is going to improve the outcome of your patient all right so dobutamine is a beautiful drug but it causes inotropy and vasodilation it causes inotropy and vasodilation so let's call it a inodilator it's an inodilator it causes inotropy and vasodilation it's a good drug to actually use in cardiogenic shock but do not ever start it as first line always start norepinephrine first and add it on on top of it the next weird drug i was talking to you about was milrinone now what is milrinone Mil known again is a drug that's actually going to cause inotropy as well as vasodilation now how does this one do it milrinone if you look at the mechanism of action it's actually a phosphodiesterase inhibitor now let's look at the receptors beta 1 and beta 2 what are the beta 1 and beta 2 receptors guys are they gs coupled yes they are right gs coupled so when you stimulate a gs receptor you'll eventually form a lot of cyclic amp which brings upon the response that you actually require if you go back to your pharmacology you will learn that the breakdown of cyclic AMP is by phosphodiesterase enzyme so if you actually block the phosphodiesterase enzyme you will raise the level of cyclic AMP so basically you're going to enhance the effect of beta 1 and beta 2 receptors so beta 1 is good that's what you want it for a cardiogenic shock patient you want to use it to get a good squeeze but you are also going to get an increased response of beta 2 receptors and beta 2 
causes vasodilation. Is it a good drug? Yes, it is. But are you going to use it as first line? No, you're not. What is always going to be your first line, guys? Norepinephrine. So start norepinephrine and add on milrinone to it. Now, this brings us pretty much to the end of the lecture. So now you know the pressers that you're going to play with and how you're going to play with and when you're going to use these pressers. Nevertheless, once you start a patient oppressor, this is something I'm going to go into much more detail in an upcoming lecture. But for now, I just want you to understand a few little things. When you have a patient in shock and the patient is on oppressor support, what are the things that you're actually going to monitor in this patient? First off, you're going to target a MAP greater than 65, mean arterial blood pressure greater than 65. Who came up with this number 65? Well, a lot of studies actually proven that a MAP of 65 is really what is required. Why? Why is 65? Well, the thing is this. Think about your vital organs in your body, which is such as brain, your heart, your mesenteric, your intestine, as well as your kidneys, right? So if you think about an important pressure, what is the blood pressure that's required in your body in order to perfuse these vital organs? So what is the minimum amount of blood pressure that's required to perfuse these organs. So if you look at the brain, it's about 50 to 60. Heart, again, about 60. The intestines, about a map of 60. Kidneys, also is a map of about 60. So really, you need about 60 to 65 map to perfuse your vital organs. Then you'll be like, oh great, that's awesome. So that's why you're targeting 65. That's excellent. So why not we target a higher map then? Why don't we target 85 map map? A lot of studies actually try to use that map of using a higher map but what is the problem of attaining a higher map? You are going to use more pressors and every drug comes with this side effect, guys. If you go on a higher pressor dose, you're going to get significant tachyarrhythmias. You're going to get a significant amount of mesenteric ischemia with translocation of normal blood flow and worsening sepsis. You are going to have a lot of ischemic necrosis of your skin, digits. Using more presses is not a good thing. You want to use as minimal presses that is required to perfuse your vital organs. So map of 65 and that's the end of the story. Not more, not less. Map of 65 is what you're going to target. Awesome. So map of 65 is number one point that you have to know. Next, most of your patients are going to have a central venous catheter. So every day it is your duty to make sure the patient's tank is full. What do I mean by that? Yes, septic shock patients. Obviously, you're going to use pressors but the number one rule in a patient in septic shock is fluids how much fluids 30 ml per kg 30 ml per kg was the amount of fluid as an initial resuscitation that was discussed in the surviving sepsis campaign so 30 ml per kg is what you're going to give initially however there's a lot of talk about maybe we should cut down maybe we should go up doesn't matter important thing for now is you need to give fluids first so make sure your tank is full which means your blood vessels are full before you can squeeze it if you squeeze an empty vessel you're not going to get a blood pressure all right you need fluid in your blood vessel so central venous pressure essentially is a measure of how full your tank is right so central venous pressure what is the normal central venous pressure guys are you saying 8 to 12 you're wrong it's not normal is less than 4 but a patient on septic shock you want to maintain a higher central venous pressure you want to maintain between 8 to 12 cvp also if a patient is intubated and on mechanical ventilation then you will target a much higher central venous pressure almost up to 15. so remember cvp either 8 to 12 or if on an intubated and ventilated patient maintain about 15. all right that's number two number three urine output this is important 0.5 cc's per kilogram of body weight per hour that tells you the patient is actually having good perfusion to the kidneys so you want to monitor urine output in these patients and last but not least if you are aware of the flow track i will be talking about this in another lecture but a flow track is basically a device that is connected to your arterial line and it actually monitors your hemodynamics in actual numbers on a screen which is the greatest thing that's ever been discovered in the recent uh, past now if you look at the flow track the number you're interested in is SVRI, Systemic Vascular Resistance Index. Systemic Vascular Resistance Index is basically like your total peripheral resistance. You want your SVRI about 1900 to 2300. This is your normal total peripheral resistance or your Systemic Vascular Resistance Index. It is how much your vessel is getting squeezed. So remember, if you're having your patient on septic shock and connected to a flow track, you want your Systemic Vascular Resistance Index to be about 1900 to 2300 not more 
not less, but within this range. Well, these are just a few parameters I want you to monitor in your patient until I come up with the next lecture on static and dynamic monitoring of patients in the ICU. When you learn that one, you're gonna get much more depth into every little thing, including the flow track. Lastly, just to finish up, I just wanna mention about two important things that we have to follow in all our patients in the ICU. Number one is sugar levels. Number two is the patient on DVD prophylaxis. Now remember, whenever you're giving a person a lot of pressors, right? What it's gonna do is it's actually gonna cause significant amount of vasoconstriction. That could actually cause decreased perfusion of your skin. Now, how do you give insulin in the hospital, guys? Are you saying subcutaneous? Yes, you are, right? So if you're having a profound vasoconstriction everywhere, now what's gonna happen is the insulin that you're gonna give is not gonna get absorbed. So you can see significant amounts of hyperglycemia. That's why you see, as per the NICE sugar trial, patients with septic shock, most of the time, if your blood sugar in the ICU is greater than 180 on two occasions, these patients automatically go on an insulin drip. Not for DKA, not for HHS, not for any other problem. Just because you need to control the sugars better. High sugar is loved by bacteria. So you don't want high sugars in the ICU. Or you do not want lower sugars either. Low sugars is even worse. Anything low is worse than high, all right? So you want to remain within a range of like 180 to 200. So. If you feel like your patient's sugars are not getting controlled because of your subcutaneous insulin, immediately switch to IV insulin because the drugs that you're using is causing vasoconstriction and as a result, you're not actually absorbing the insulin. Next, the same theory is gonna apply for the patient with DVD prophylaxis. If you're giving a patient Lovanox, which you should be doing as opposed to heparin, reason being Lovanox is much more effective and has a much lower incidence of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And how is Lovanox given, guys? It is given subcutaneously, right? It is given subcutaneously. So make sure you kind of trend your patient to make sure the patient is not developing any clots. Maybe you could use venodyne boots plus your subcutaneous Lovanox. I'm not saying that everybody who uses presses is definitely going to end up getting a clot just because of this reason. That's not the point. The point is just keep it in the back of your mind. It is a side effect that you kind of have to watch out for. All right, guys. So now this concludes our lecture on presses in the ICU. If you know this much, guys, I am 100% sure you're gonna rock your stay in the ICU. All right, I'll be making many more videos in the ICU series real exciting and cool videos coming up soon all right guys so thank you for watching and i'll see you guys in the next video please subscribe if you have not already and hit the like button and the bell button so you receive notifications when we release the next video and also please leave your comments in the comment section below if you want me to do any other lectures just write them in the comment section below because we love reading what you're writing